Hello, and welcome to the fourth of six films about the higher level energetics topic. Again, we're looking at Bourne Harbour cycles here, but um, <clears throat> rather than introducing the principles, we're going to go over all those things that we talked about in the first film um, by basically carrying out a worked example. So, the sort of things we're going to review are um, identifying the species and processes that are taking part, uh, taking place at each stage of a Bourne Harbour cycle, and we're going to carry out a sample calculation, and we're going to see also, uh, towards the end of this film, how the degree of covalent character in an ionic bond might help explain any differences that we observe between an experimental and a calculated value for a lattice enthalpy. Okay, I think the best way to review all the things that we've done is to construct a Born Harbour cycle from this data and to talk about what I'm doing at each stage and then to find this thing that we're being asked to find, the electron affinity of oxygen or the second electron affinity of oxygen. Now I'm slightly worried that um, I'm not going to be able to fit all this on the screen but let's have a go. Okay, what we know is that we can take magnesium and react it with oxygen. Oops, it's not a very good start. Let's try again. We can take magnesium as a solid and react it with oxygen, which is a gas in its standard state. And we can form one mole of magnesium oxide. Okay, and if we form one mole of a substance, from its elements in their standard states, then this is the enthalpy of formation, the standard enthalpy of formation. And we're told here that the standard enthalpy of formation of magnesium oxide is minus 602 kilojoules per mole. Okay, I'm also told the lattice enthalpy of magnesium oxide. So I'm just going to extend this line a bit here so that we've got as much room as possible over here on the right. This is the lattice enthalpy, okay, of magnesium oxide. And remember the definition of that. That is taking one mole of an ionic substance and turning it into its gaseous ions. Okay, so here are the gaseous ions that make up magnesium oxide. Right, let's think again about how we could get from these elements to these ions. Instead of going round this way, we go this way. Okay, so first of all, if we're going to turn magnesium into gaseous magnesium ions, we've got to turn it into a gas. So we'll turn the magnesium solid into magnesium gas. What would that be? That would be the enthalpy of atomization of magnesium. And we know here uh, that that is 148 kilojoules per mole. Okay? We've still got a half O2 as a gas here. Okay? Nothing's changed about the oxygen yet. Now, if we want to turn it into a 2 plus ion, we've got to take an electron away from it. Okay, this is the first ionization energy of magnesium. So first IE here. And 738 kilojoules per mole. What would I write on this level here? Well, I've now got a magnesium 1 plus ion in the gaseous state, half an oxygen molecule still, and I've got an electron. Okay, now I can turn this 1 plus ion into a 2 plus ion. Okay, this would be the second ionization energy of magnesium. And as we might expect, Right, This is much bigger than the first because we're now taking an electron away from a 1 plus ion instead of away from an atom. So now we've got a magnesium 2 plus ion. We've got half an oxygen molecule still. And we've got two electrons here now. Okay. Now then, what's next? I'm not doing any of this to scale, by the way, so hopefully it will work out at the end. But anyway, what do I have to do next? I've got to break this bond here, because I've got to turn it into gaseous atoms, and these are molecules at the moment, so I'm just going to put the arrow over here now. What is this energy change? Well, it's half of 499. Why a half? Because this is a bond enthalpy, which refers to one mole of bonds. This should say kilojoules per mole, but it's obviously dropped off in the table. So this is half a mole of bonds, so we've got half that value. What do we have now on this level? Well, we've still got a magnesium 2 plus ion. We've now got an oxygen atom in the gaseous state, and we've still got these two electrons. Now, this oxygen atom could gain one of those two electrons. Okay, 
I'm just deliberately doing this as bigger than that size because I know I've got to go up on the next level. But anyway, so now if it gained one, I'd end up with magnesium 2 plus, which would still be a gas, even though I didn't show that here or here. Okay, and I've also got an O minus ion, which is a very unstable thing, but we're imagining we could have isolated it. Okay, and we've still got one electron. What's over here? This is the first electron affinity of oxygen, so minus one for one. Remember, it's exothermic because electrons like getting stuck to atoms. Okay, and then this here, I can just ex maybe I'll just extend this line here in green and this line here. Okay, this is where we're adding this second electron to oxygen. Okay, we're adding it to an O minus ion, so this is the second electron affinity of oxygen. And you can see that O minus gas is turning into O2 minus gas. Okay, so first thing to note there, or to, not to note, because hopefully you've been kind of noting this as you go along, right? What we've done here so far is we've shown where all these bits of information fit on a born harbor cycle and what's written on each level, including the state symbols. Okay, now that we've got this born harbor cycle, we can calculate this value here. Okay, because we're going from here to here, but we can't go that way, so we need to go round this loop. Okay, so we're going to go against this arrow, so it's going to be minus. 141. So in other words, minus sorry, minus minus 141. So this is going to be 141. Then we're going to be going against this arrow here. So minus a half of that value. So minus a half of 499. We're going against this. So this will be minus 1450. Okay, and against this one. So minus 738. And against this one. So minus 148. And against and not against this one, I should say, with this one here. So this will be minus 602. And we're going with this arrow here. Are we told this one? Yes, we are. That's 3890. Okay, so we're going to then add 3890 to this, all this stuff that we've already calculated here. And check this, because I may well have got it wrong. Um, but the answer that I got for this value here was then 843.5 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so we've not only constructed and labelled our Vaughan Harbour cycle, what have we missed out? We've missed out uh, this one here, this was the second ionisation energy of magnesium. What was this one here? This was the half the bond enthalpy of oxygen, half the bond enthalpy. And we didn't label this one either. This was the first electron affinity, and this was the second electron affinity. Okay, not only have we labeled it and shown what's there at each stage, we've also used it to calculate an unknown value. Okay, so that's the sort of thing, or that's the sort of skills that you need to have. It's very unlikely that you'll have to do all of that in an IB exam, but any particular stage of it you ought to be able to do. Now, that thing that we've just calculated is actually the experimental way of finding a lattice enthalpy, okay? Because each of the values was found from an experimental or from an experiment, we can find the, a missing value and call it an experimental value. Lattice enthalpies are also calculated using electrostatic principles. So taking into consideration the charge on ions and their size, we can calculate how much energy it ought to take to break them up per mole of lattice. Right? We can't do that in an IV exam, certainly not. Okay, That's way beyond what we have to do, but it can be done. And what we, can, what we can be asked to do in an IB exam is to compare this experimental value, sorry, compare this experimental value that we've found from a Born Harbor cycle with a calculated value. And sometimes we find that they're quite different. Now, it's important to realize that the calculated value is based on purely ionic bonding. Okay? Now, this means that if a, an atom, like a silver atom, were to give an electron to an atom like iodine and form a great big ion like an iodide ion and a very small ion like a silver ion, 
If it was purely ionic bonding, then this electron would remain completely in control of the iodine, or the iodide ion. But because this ion is quite small, and because it can pull some of this electron density back towards it, it can distort this ion here. These electrons that are on the iodide ion can end up kind of in the space between these two ions, and now this ionic bond takes on some covalent character. Okay? So, there will be discrepancies between the experimental and the calculated values if the bond has a significant degree of covalent character. That is to say, if the negative ion is distorted significantly by the positive ion. These electrons are pulled back towards it. When will the largest discrepancies arise? Well, that's when this ion has a very, very big electron cloud that is easily distorted. And this is a very, very small ion that has a lot of polarizing power or a lot of ability to distort electron clouds. So the largest discrepancies will arise when there's a big difference in the size of the ions, when this is a highly charged ion, and when this is a very large negative ion. Okay? Or in other words, I suppose you could say when the electri electronegativity differences between these two th atoms aren't that big. Okay, so look out for those kind of questions. Why is there a difference between them? Well, because the calculated values are based purely on ionic interactions, whereas in actual fact, there can be some covalent character to an ionic bond. And when will there be the most covalent character? That's when the largest discrepancies arise. And that's this situation that we've just been describing here. Okay, the good news is that's the end of Born Harbor cycles, and there's nothing else to do about them. There is now some stuff about entropy and Gibbs free energy coming up, but I think by comparison, it's quite simple. So hopefully you understand how to draw a Born Harbor cycle and how to label all the species and processes there. Um, and also, you can kind of think about the fact that bonding in an ionic lattice is unlikely to be purely ionic and that can lead to them some discrepancies between the experimental and calculated values. Please make sure if you get confused by any of this stuff that you come and ask as quickly as you can or post a comment on YouTube because it shouldn't be too difficult to get full marks on these questions once you've understood it.